Hello and good evening. Welcome to this Sanctuary Foundation event. We're so pleased that you've been able to join us. My name is Chris Kandaya. I'm going to be your host for the evening. And it just brings me great joy that you are here. We, are, we were hoping that we might get a few hundred people to join us as we consider how we are going to welcome Ukrainian refugees to the United Kingdom. But I'll tell you how many people are here. 6,217 uh, and climbing. It's fabulous. And I'm seeing people have come uh, from all over the UK, from Shoreham, from Kent, uh, from Bridgend, from Berkshire. It's just amazing. I need to tell you a little bit of the story of what's happened and how we come to be here at all. Um, I have some special guests to introduce you to throughout the evening. And our hope and our vision for tonight is that you feel better equipped to be able to offer a refugee family from Ukraine uh, an opportunity to come to the UK through what's been described as humanitarian sponsorship. Let me tell you a little bit of the story uh, and then we'll introduce you to some of our guests. So my name is Chris Kandahar. What, what do I do? I have, I have a couple of jobs that I do. Uh, one is I help the government think through adoption and special guardianship. Uh, but that's just one day of my week. And I wasn't quite sure what I'd be doing with the rest of my life until I found out that a whole group of people from Hong Kong were coming to the United Kingdom. You might not know this, but last year alone, 100,000, it's estimated, people from Hong Kong came to the UK, mostly during the pandemic. And it's tough moving countries in the middle of a pandemic. And so we were able to step up uh, support for Hong Kongers uh, using civil society groups and churches to make sure that Hong Kong people got a really warm welcome. And that was uh, uh, something called UKHK. And then one day we get a call from the government. They said, well, we like what you've been doing with Hong Kongers, but is there any way that you could help people from Afghanistan? And uh, as you probably saw on the news, um, we were airlifting people out of Kabul airport because the Taliban were coming in. And many of these people came with just what they could carry in their hands. And you might remember that picture of the world record. I don't think they were trying to break a world record, but how many people can you fit into a cargo plane? It was absolutely desperate. And uh, once again, civil society groups, churches and, and other people wrapped around uh, the communities of Afghans that have arrived into Britain. And uh, what happened was the government put everybody into hotels. So there's around 11 and a half thousand Afghans that are still in hotels. And uh, that's not great. It's not a great way to be able to rebuild your life after you've experienced trauma. But we set something up called Afghan Welcome to try and make sure that Afghans got the welcome that they needed. Um, and then we got another call. And that call was to say, look, things are kicking off in Ukraine. And uh, what is it that civil society can do with government to help Ukrainians come to the UK? And you might remember on the 1st of March, um, our Home Secretary, Priti Patel, announced that there would be a new programme, the Humanitarian Sponsorship Programme. And she said that individuals, families, churches, community groups and businesses could work together to be able to offer sponsorship to Ukrainians that needed to come to the UK. Up until that time, only a very small number of Ukrainians were able to come here if they had close family connections. And uh, something in us said that wasn't right. And so this program was promised. Now, I always like to encourage the government when they're doing something good. It's a parenting technique. I use it with my children. I try not to tell them off too much. I try to tell them when they're doing something right. So they do it again and again. And I thought this idea of an uncapped humanitarian sponsorship scheme was a good one because that means that if we can find sponsors, new people from Ukraine can come to the UK. And as we watched the unfolding tragedy that was going on in Ukraine, um, many of us thought we ought to do more. And I don't know about you, I, I look at a, a lovely little country like Moldova. I'm actually going there tomorrow. But Moldova has about 2.7 million people that live in it. And that's about the same size, or maybe even a little bit smaller, than Greater Manchester. And Moldova received 100,000 refugees. And uh, when I was um, thinking about this, the UK at that time had only received 30 refugees. And I thought, look, this is an imbalance. We, the United Kingdom, need to play our part in welcoming 
Ukrainian refugees. We don't need to take everybody, but we're part of the continent of Europe. So let's do what we can to make sure we play our part. So I phoned a friend and uh, actually we'd never met before. I put a tweet out and then he sent me his phone number and uh, he said, look, I'm a whiz at making websites. I said, brilliant. And I found another friend who could help me with a bit of social media, another friend uh, who could help us with GDPR. And suddenly we thought, let's do something. So we launched the Sanctuary Foundation. And I don't know about you, launching things at 10 o'clock on a Friday night is a really bad idea. This was, oh, I think maybe nine days ago. I'm running out of uh, days of the week. I can't remember what day it is even today. And uh, we thought we'd get a few responses, but by the end of the weekend, uh, we'd had about uh, maybe 600 people saying they wanted to sponsor a refugee. And some of those were businesses, some of those were churches. And we thought, oh, that's exciting. Uh, and then the Sunday Times picked us up and uh, suddenly we had a few more. And then we got invited onto television programs. And on Friday last week, uh, we had 2,000. So over a week, we had 2,000 people step forward. That's amazing. And we got invited onto Breakfast TV, fantastic. And um, after the Breakfast TV, that jumped uh, to something like 6,000. And then we got invited again onto Breakfast TV on Monday, and it jumped to more like 11,000. And then Simon Thomas, who you're going to meet uh, today, and Catelyn Moran, some of you will know, they got behind us. And I think currently, you might know this better than me, 23,000 people have said they wanted to help Ukrainian refugees to come here. So that was fabulous. We've mobilized civil society. We're ready to do it, government. We're here for you. What can we do to help? And um, that that brings us to, I think, the day before yesterday, um, the government announced that phase one of its refugee program for Ukraine is going to start with quite a small group of people. It's people in the UK that know somebody in Ukraine that they can name. And if they've got spare room in their house, they can apply. I think the scheme is going to open on Friday, but we have someone from the government to help us with that. Um, they can apply to be the first round of the sponsorship program. And some of you are thinking, great, that's amazing. I know someone in Ukraine and I've got room in my house. That works for me. But most of us, and we've been polling you, don't know anyone in Ukraine. And therefore, you're probably wondering, well, what can you do? Or some of you tonight are thinking, hang on, um, I'm, I could be part of a team of people that could wrap around Ukrainians, but I, I don't have space. If I did, I'd let Ukrainians come and live here. I don't have space. What can I do? Some of you might be church leaders thinking, as a church, we could do something. Or businesses. What could I do? So we'll try and explore some of those things together. But a lot of it depends on phase two coming from the government um, pretty soon. So what we're going to be doing tonight is focusing on those of us that are able to play our part in welcoming Ukrainians, whether that's individuals, whether that's people that know people or not, whether that's going to be businesses or churches or other community groups, will begin to lay it out for you so that you'll have a better picture at the end of this evening. Now, just a little bit of housekeeping. Oh, we now have 8,074. Uh, brilliant. Nice to see you. Uh, you're very welcome. Uh, you can use the YouTube chat to communicate with us. I wish we were all in a room. That would be fantastic. But we're in a, a YouTube meeting. So you can tell us what questions that you have. I also like it when we use these channels to cheer people on. So you're going to hear from some fantastic people. You're going to hear from uh, some friends of ours who are still in Ukraine. And if, if you hear something that you can applaud or encourage, uh, we won't be able to hear you, but you could just type it in the chat. Cheer people on. Tell them that you're with them. This is an opportunity for you to put your mark and say, we want to do our best to help Ukrainians. That's our vision tonight. Uh, we're going to start with our first guest. And uh, he's actually an old friend of mine. And his name is Russell Rook. And uh, Russell has been advising the government on this scheme. Uh, Russell, good, good to see you again. Um, I don't mean to be rude, but we, we asked for the Secretary of State. Uh, he was busy. We understand that. We asked for Richard Harrington. He was going to come. And uh, sadly, uh, he gives his apologies because he has to uh, give a presentation at the House of Lords. But to be honest, mate, I was so excited. It's you. Uh, you've been involved in the refugee at work for many years, you know, going back to the Syrian crisis and before. What can you tell us about what's going on with the government and the welcoming refugees? What is the appetite that you're hearing from our government right now? 
Well, I think, Chris, firstly, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I'm, I'm very much at the bottom of the food chain as far as kind of important people in government and the civil service are concerned. But I'm really honoured. And it's amazing that so many people have gathered tonight. Uh, I mean, what I can tell you is that our government is, is doing something really quite remarkable. You know, for, for many years, so back in 2014, the United Kingdom only used to welcome 750 refugees a year for those years up until 2015. And then in 2015, David Cameron said, we're going to take 23,000 Syrians. And now we've moved to a point where actually what the government wants to take is many, many, many thousands of Ukrainians. There's no cap to it. They will take as many Ukrainians into this country as the great British public want to welcome into their communities. And so we're, we're living in an amazing time because, you know, we've got great refugee charities in this country. We've got great local authorities in this country. But the greatest asset we've got at a time when these people desperately need sanctuary is a great British public, uh, which is warm, which is welcoming, which is hugely compassionate and has signed up, as you said, in their thousands, tens of thousands on the government website. Now, over 100,000 have expressed their interest in welcoming someone from Ukraine into their community to give them both safety and hopefully a whole new life. And so we're on the edge of something really exciting, but it's only possible because of our community in this country. Thank you, Russell. Uh, some people have been quite critical at the UK's response. It, they say it's been too slow. Um, and now when the government's revealed the first stage of its plan, the criticism is it's not developed enough. Um, sometimes it feels you're kind of damned if you do and damned if you yeah. don't. What do we do? What's, what's your advice to us as you know the great British public, all 8,235 of us on this evening? What's the best strategy, do you think, for us to encourage the government to do its bit and help us to help Ukrainian refugees? Well, it's quite simple, really. It's to really step up over these next few days, Chris. You know, all 8,235 of us and the others that couldn't make it tonight, the tens of thousands that couldn't be here, now is our opportunity to show just how welcoming we can be as communities and as a country. And so the government has put this scheme in place, which really says, OK, if you want to welcome people, over to you. You can do it. You can do it as, as yeah. residents, as citizens of the United Kingdom. So the first thing is make the most of the opportunity we've got and let's start welcoming thousands of people from Ukraine. You're all right. You're right, Chris. We can always do more. We can always do quicker. We can always do better. But at first, we've got to start somewhere. And we start by stepping up and saying, yeah, we're going to sponsor thousands of people into this country. And then we're going to do it better and bigger and bigger and better from this day forward. That's so helpful, Russ. And look, I know you're a Manchester United fan and, and I'm a <laughs> Liverpool fan. And mm. I can't remember where you guys are in the table mm. or what's happened about the Champions League. No idea about that. But... <laughs> You know, to use a footballing metaphor, the, I feel like the ball has been passed to us as civil society to play our part. And if we step up, we could have hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian refugees here if, if they want to come. And, and we need to kind of make that offer to government and to the Ukrainian people to say, if you want to, there is space here for you. So that that for me is is exciting. And look, I'm only teasing about Manchester United and Liverpool, but we we are coming together from all sorts of different places in the UK. Uh, some people have faith, some people have no faith, some people that are kind of politically conservative, some people that are politically, you know, Labour or Lib Dem. We're putting that aside. This is a humanitarian response, yeah. and it's just been fabulous to see the nation step up. Um, a few questions have, have come up, Russ, um, in the chat uh, around safeguarding. Mm -hmm. And um, this, this is a concern. I, when I was sat on the sofa next to Naga Munchetti, I was so excited. I wasn't allowed to get <laughs> close to her. Um, but, you know, great to see another Asian on TV. That's fantastic. Um, that was one of her questions she asked me. Yeah. You know, how do we keep people safe? Obviously, people coming from Ukraine have experienced loads of trauma. Yeah. And it's wonderful that people want to open their houses. But how do we keep people safe from uh, abuse in that circumstance? What, what, what are you hearing? Well, so, so the first thing is, Chris, this, this program enables lots of people to sponsor Ukrainians. What it also will do is check that those people are safe 
So there will be some checks for sponsors to make sure that they are the kind of people that don't have a criminal record, that haven't got a history that would preclude them from doing this well. And likewise, those coming in will have a degree of checks around security and other issues. I think the other thing to say is that our government in doing this programme will be keeping an eye. There will be monitoring how things go. It won't be just, oh, meet them at the airport and over to you. There will be ways in which government want to check that this is going well. And I also want to say, because this is a civil society response, we are blessed and you've got a whole bunch of people on the show tonight who are working with charities who help people to do this stuff well. And so mm. some of us watching this have never resettled a refugee or had a refugee in our home or worked on a refugee project. And so That's what right. we have in this country is lots of organisations that can help you to do it. It is entirely possible for you to do that really well, but we would encourage you to get training, get support, read up, get as much information as you can and get some charities around you and some support Good. around you so you can deliver this safely for your sake as well as for those coming in. That's so helpful. I guess for me, there's there's two aspects to that. This, this feels like an evacuation. This is an emergency situation. Yeah. You know, the governments have to do things really quickly and, yeah. and the civil society groups and charities are also trying to work as quickly as they can. So it's not perfect. It's not what you do under normal circumstances. It's a bit like when you're trying to get out of a house that's on fire. Normally, you'd end, you know, you'd exit in an orderly fashion and you'd make sure you were dressed nicely, but in an emergency, things have to change a little bit. Um, and, and so I guess that's phase one. Let's get as many sponsors as we can registering through the government site. Fantastic. It's over 100,000. Brilliant. And um, what we can do at Sanctuary Foundation, we're working very closely with Reset, who you're going to meet in a bit, uh, is that Reset have loads of experience in training people in the practical things they need in order to be a great host. So our advice is, if you haven't already, you know, register on the government site, let the government know you're there, and then come through Sanctuary Foundation as well, and we'll do more of these kind of events. This is a taster event um, for all sorts of the practical things that you're going to need uh, in order to help people arrive safely. Just one last question for you, Russ. Um, well, maybe two. <laughs> what is actually going to happen on Friday? That Friday is the big day that people are talking about. What's going to happen on Friday? And realistically, how can we help set people's expectations? Let's say they, they meet all the criteria. You know, they, they, they've got space in their house. You know, they're going to pass a DBS check or whatever that is going to involve. There's a Ukrainian family that they know um, mm. that, that they can connect with. I mean, are, are we talking days, weeks? months what's a realistic expectation because some of us are raring to go and we wish our, our houses were full of refugees already but help us to to, to pace it out you know what what do you think we should yeah. expect so firstly on friday those people who know someone or know of someone, it doesn't need to be someone you know very well, but someone you know of someone in Ukraine or one of those border countries who needs to come here, on Friday, you can go to the government website and apply to be a sponsor and put your details in and put their details in. And then the process should be, Chris, pretty quick. We would expect to see people arriving within one week. So wow. you as the sponsor will have to help sort the travel arrangements for this person or for those persons. And then they should be able to be with you, actually, certainly in a matter of uh, a week or so. In some cases, it might be a matter of days. Now, for some people, you're sitting there thinking, but I don't know anyone in Ukraine. And so one of the things we want to encourage you is to think about your community. Think about businesses or churches or community groups around you is there other people who know someone from ukraine and you can help bring that person into your community either that or are there other people sponsoring people and can you do something to support those people are welcoming people from ukraine because we always say chris you know it takes a village to raise a child in the same way it takes a community to welcome a refugee it's not a kind of a solo business it's not a solo show it's a team job so what we would say to you is if you're not going to be a sponsor well find someone who is a sponsor mm. and help them and so there's lots that people can do regardless of whether they're ready to, to to sponsor someone on friday if you are please go ahead and do it if you're not please go ahead and find some way of supporting this in the next weeks and months. So helpful, Russell. Thank you so much. I'm going to introduce you to two people now. Uh, someone who came to visit me tonight uh, is here uh, from Ukraine, and I'm going to invite um, uh, oh, oh, 
Olga to come and sit with me. This is going to be a bit close. Hope you don't mind. And um, then we're going to introduce our, our friend Aliena as well. And uh, Russ, I think you're going to drop out. Thank you for joining us. Great, great work. Um, let me start with Olga and then we'll talk to Olena. Um, Olga, you've arrived in the UK and you've arrived in my house, which is lovely. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Um, you're, you're not a refugee yet. You're here as a as a as a tourist, which is fantastic. Um, but talk us through those first few days of what happened in Ukraine when you heard. I believe you were woken up at five a.m. in the morning one day. Yes. Yeah, so twenty four February, as everybody knows, uh, the war started and um, Russia invaded Ukraine without even declaring the war uh, at night. Uh, and we woke up at 5 a.m. because of the sirens, you know, and it was so shocking because I was thinking it's probably ambulance. Mm. And it wasn't, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, it was sirens. And, um, and it, was, it was an absolute shock for all my family, for all my friends and everybody, uh, for one day, we probably couldn't really think clear. We couldn't really understand what to do next. And, um, and then we got, um, we got the offer from our friend. There was a girl who had a car, but she couldn't drive. And my boyfriend, uh, who is British citizen, but he lived in Ukraine with me, um, he could drive. So it was a very difficult decision for me because my family and my friends and everybody, you know, I mm. know they were still there. Um, but we decided to we decided to leave um, and to drive to Hungarian border to cross the border there. Mm. And I didn't even have the chance to say, um, you know, proper goodbye to my parents. I didn't. I didn't see them. Hmm. Uh, we just had a quick chat, and they actually also encouraged encouraged me to to leave. Hmm. Olga, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Ho hopefully, soon some people are going to be coming from Ukraine to the United Kingdom, and just hearing the emotion in your voice as you think about your family left behind, what are some of the emotions you think people are going to feel when they leave their country and then come here? What, what, how, how can we be ready? To understand what they're going through uh, well obviously it's a, it's a very traumatic experience and um i think that you know just supporting uh, like saying some you know supportive words and um probably you know sometimes just just have a hug you know and <laughs> things like this it's it's really helpful and i see old people and the british community in 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 this uh down Henley, especially like it's it's just amazing support, and um, I'm on behalf of probably all Ukrainians um, very grateful, mm -hmm. um, very grateful for all your support. And um, yeah, it's just dramatic experience. Mm -hmm. So we have to. You you said something very moving uh, over dinner. Uh, you said that you haven't just left your family; you've left 44 million people of your family back home. Yeah. So. I just say this to everybody who is asking me, you know, how am I? I'm like, and how is my family? I'm like, don't ask me how is my family because my family is 44 million people right now. And my heart breaks every time I see, mm -hmm. um, you know, all these people struggling and suffering um, under, you know, bombs and in bomb mm -hmm. shelters. It's Thank you. Stay, stay with us. Um, we're hoping that, that many of the Ukrainians in the UK and those in Ukraine uh, can sense this sense of solidarity that many British people are feeling with Ukraine. Some of us have been wearing yellow and blue or a little flower just to say we're with Ukraine. Um, I'd love it if you might suggest into the chat what we might do, there's, there's currently 8,400 of us watching this show. Uh, imagine we were to do something as an act of solidarity. What could we do? Maybe, uh, you know, one <coughs> idea we were talking about, uh, my friend wants us to paint our fingernails yellow and blue and take pictures of it and share it. Others are saying, let's go out tomorrow and let's wear yellow and blue and take selfies of us. You know, have a think about what we could do as an act of solidarity. We'll crowdsource that. But let's hear from Olena. Olena, 
you are in Ukraine right now in a village just a few miles away from Kyiv where we're, we're just seeing devastating pictures and you know I can't imagine what you're going through help us understand how you're feeling and uh, what is happening right now in Ukraine uh, hello everybody first of all I would like to thank you all for your support we here in Ukraine know that there are two countries that support us the most Poland and UK we hear it and I'm uh, I myself I uh, am in a relatively safe place if, if there is any safe place in Ukraine. I mean, I'm really close to the city and I'm very close to the town that suffered the most recently. And for the last seven days, I could see the refugees from these towns coming through our village. So we were the first uh, safe place on their route. Uh, so all these people from Irpin, Bucha, Hastomel, maybe you, maybe all the world already know knows the names of the towns. I could see them. It uh, it looked really terrible. I couldn't help crying even just by seeing them. So I cannot even imagine how much they suffered staying in the basement without anything uh, uh, for two weeks. Um, uh, so, um, as far as I know, by now, uh, uh, it's already 3 million people uh, from Ukraine who are refugees already outside of Ukraine. And I don't know how, how many are refugees inside the country. Um, uh, so, I think that you can really help those people. Most of the people are uh, probably uh, women with small children. Mm. And, uh, yes, they need your help. And I, you. I'm here, actually, uh, I'm very interested to hear what you're doing because I, I think that, that I can share uh, this information with people I know. Actually, I even asked it in my Facebook just yesterday if there are anybody uh, who I know who wants to uh, go to UK. And mm. I, I know at least a couple of people who are really yes. interested in this in, information. Mm, Thank yes. you, Elena. Yeah. It, it was a question I had for you on that. I was hearing for many Ukrainians, the UK is not on their map. Uh, it's not somewhere they think they're going to come because they think our system might be difficult or um, we don't necessarily treat people well from other countries. Uh, is that true? And what could we do, us 8,000 people, what could we do to change that perception? Because that's not what we want to be saying to the world. I think that the only restriction for people uh, not uh, to come to Britain was the problem with the UK visa. It was very difficult for Ukrainians to get it before. Uh, so if there is no restriction with the visa, I think uh, people will be very willing to go to your country because Ukrainians like we, we like UK. So <laughs> and we we like you too. We're, we're we're glad to be able to be on this call with you. Um, just in, in terms of your plans, are you planning to leave or are you going to stay? Help us understand the different mindsets there are in Ukraine. Uh, since I do not have dependents, I'm kind of uh, independent here. So I just don't want to leave. I don't want to leave and uh, I don't want to flee and live in fear anywhere. So I want to stay here as long as it's possible. That's uh, my opinion. But yes, many of my friends, especially uh, women with small children, they are already somewhere in Europe. And yes, it's very difficult for them because, you know, Poland is already overcrowded. All the mm. closest countries are overcrowded. And they are looking for some places in Portugal, Spain, so quite far away from, from Ukraine. And also you need to understand that almost all the people who are refugees now, they don't want to move uh, anywhere forever they want yes. to come back as soon as possible so any support for them during certain time before our victory is just necessary it's crucial for them excellent I, I hear that from all of the ukrainians i speak to that they're not trying to get out of ukraine just to get out of ukraine they just need somewhere temporary until it's safe to come and help rebuild their yes. country and if we our can provide country, that for you our country is great and now we appreciate it even more. So mm. just help us win and uh, help us uh, host the people suffering yes, now yes. and then just uh, return them back to our country. It's great. We are very grateful to have you here. It's important to us that we hear from you because um, sometimes when, when, when people mobilize, uh, they just want to send stuff. 
And um, it's important to hear what's actually going on so that our help is useful. So a um, few of you asking about uh, what practical things we can do, that's coming up. For us, it's an important value that we don't do things to people, but we work with people. And so it's important that you help shape our response. So Olena, Olga, thank you very much for joining us. It's been a pleasure thank to see you, you and uh, hope, hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have, um, we have another guest uh, joining us. You might recognize him from uh, Sky TV. Uh, he had a, a hugely successful career as a, a TV presenter. And recently, uh, he's, he's doing more of that again, which is uh, wonderful. It's great to be able to welcome Simon Thomas. And um, uh, Simon, good, good to see you. Hello, Chris. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, I want you to help us understand that the thought process, the, the, the questions that a family or an individual might need to ask themselves before they're ready to put themselves forward. There are people on this call who haven't decided yet, you know, should I register on the government website and say that I'm willing to receive uh, a refugee family? What are some of the things that you, you as your family thought through before you step forward? Well, I was just going to tell a very quick story before I, I say that in, in where my kind of heart for, for refugees came from. Um, one or two people watching this may know that I, I lost my first wife very suddenly four years ago. Uh, and her name was Gemma. And we had an eight year old boy at the time. And she was already in the middle of housing a Ukrainian, uh, sorry, a Syrian refugee family in Reading, where we were living at the time. So she worked with our church, local authorities and the Home Office and the church had provided a house. And, and sadly, after she died, uh, she never got to see that family move in. So that was in many ways her legacy. And it's something that has meant an awful lot to my boy, Ethan, who's now 12 years of age. And I've since remarried and um, my wife's Darina. And we've just been talking about this really as soon as those horrific images began to emerge, as soon as the Russians began this awful attack on this precious country. We, like so many, I guess, watching on now and beyond, were just that, that horrid feeling of helplessness. Like, what on earth do we do? What can we do? Uh, and I mentioned this on BBC Breakfast yesterday. Really, the moment for me where I just thought, I wish I could do something, was when that incredible photo was displayed of men and women gathered at Berlin railway station with those mm. incredible placards above their heads, offering one room, two rooms, that they could take on a family of two, a family of three. And I just thought, I wish as a family we could do that. But as we thought about it more and more, it began to dawn on us that, of course, this, this is a real game changer in terms of home life. And you have to begin, which is what we've been doing over the last couple of weeks. And we've really got behind what you, Chris, are doing through the Sanctuary Foundation and everyone who's got involved, really thinking through as well as supporting and saying, yes, yes, we want to sponsor Ukrainian family. We have enough room, thankfully. We're blessed enough to live somewhere where we can have people mm. living in our house and we're okay financially to do that. But we have had to think through those practical things because, as I said on the on the telly yesterday, you've got to think through what this doesn't just look like on that first day you meet them, which will undoubtedly be emotional, particularly for them, but probably also for you, actually. What does it look like in a week's time? What does it look like in four weeks' time, a month's time, six months, as Michael Gove was talking about a few days ago, and perhaps beyond. Uh, and there's nothing wrong, Chris, in asking those questions. It doesn't mean you don't care. It doesn't mean you're heartless. It's just about saying, can we do this? Because as you know, Olga and Elena have been touching already, and you have, you know, these people are doing something that they've never, ever wanted to do. They can't even begin to imagine that this is now their reality, that they are trying mm. to find somewhere to stay and be sheltered in a foreign land. And, and one of the things that we did, myself and Dorina with Ethan, was really talking through as much as we could. We clearly cannot even begin to imagine what it's like to walk in their shoes. But just mm. to imagine for a moment for him what that might be like had this happen to us as a country? Can he imagine what it would feel like for him and Dorina now to be leaving the house in which I'm sat if it was still standing or was under threat and make their way to the coast and try and get to France and find shelter with a family in France whilst their dad, whilst I'm left behind to perhaps fight like so many Ukrainian young and old men are having to do. And I just got him to think through that. So to think through the kind of people we're going to be welcoming, hopefully, if we're able to do this mm. and the scheme works, 
they're going to be incredibly traumatized. But what's this going to look like in terms of how daily life works? You know, Darina's got a job. I have work as well. Ethan's got school just down the road. There's kids. How do we go about getting them into the school system? How do we go about integrating them into family life? This isn't about, Chris, you know, people turning up and the room they'd be in here is just right above my head and saying, right, we'll, we'll bring you food three times a day and we'll, we'll see you at the end of the week. They're going yes. to become part of your family life. And, and that's a huge change. So I just encourage everyone, as I said on BBC Breakfast yesterday, I am not trying to put people off. We're not mm. trying to put people off, but yes. do think through it. And, and I, I kept, I'll finish off by saying this on this question. I've heard this phrase a lot in the last few days, and I think it's so true. And that is this. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Mm. You know, we want everything to be absolutely right. Every system to be in place. But these people need help, not yesterday. Yes. They need it now. So helpful, Simon. I love that. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. The system we know is not going to be perfect. Um, you know, the, from either end, you know, from the, the government's end or our end, it's not going to be perfect. But we need to do something and therefore we'll kind of put up with it. I, I think that's important. And really helpful advice there about talking it through with your wider family. This is, you know, that this isn't just going to affect you, it affects every single member of your family and maybe even your neighbours too. And, and I love that strategy that you had with your son to help him to empathise. Maybe you're in a, a partnership or a couple uh, where one of you is really for it and the other one's not. How can you talk about this in a way that's going to help both of you get on board or even the kids too? Really, really helpful practical advice. That's that's wonderful. Um, let's bring Ionia in. Uh, Ionia has lots of experience. Uh, Ionia is um, one of the team at Upbeat Communities, which is a hosting um, organization. We've been delighted to work with Upbeat, at helping young Hong Kongers that didn't have anywhere safe to live. Uh, Ionia, what are some of the things that families, we've heard a few of those things from Simon, what are some of the things that we need to be talking through to check whether we're ready to be able to receive a refugee family? Thank you, Chris. Um, so at Upbeat, we've been running a hosting scheme for over five years. We work with um, destitute asylum seekers, those who have come to the end of their road with their immigration case, and refugees who are waiting for more permanent accommodation. So we already work with. There are many refugees in this country already and many people who are seeking refuge who are desperate um, for a host family to stay with. They do not want to be living on the street and they don't want to be sofa surfing and they need a safe place to be able to put a fresh claim together for the home office to hear their case. Um, so in with, within Upbeat and Upbeat is I know, your, your staff <laughs> might be interacting with your... Um, your microphone, maybe. We're, we're, we're picking up a little crackle. I'm sorry. Oh, is that better? I hope so. Let's see how we get on. Thank you. Okay, apologies. Um, it is part of NACOM, which is a national uh, organisation that works with lots of hosting charities around the country, and they come with a wealth of experience in hosting. And um, some of the things that we feel are important is preparing the host. We are here tonight because we are compassionate and we want to make a difference and we want to put our compassion into to action. Um, however, there is a reality to what we're offering and we don't want anybody to go in with their eyes closed. We want yes. to, be, to be realistic. Six months is a long time to host mm -hmm. a family who is in trauma. Um, a lot of hosting organisations around the country within NACOM um, offer recruitment, safeguarding training, training in terms of boundaries, that whole power and ethics um, thing that we need to be talking about and being aware of. Um, we don't want to have the attitude of, oh, we're hosting poor refugees. These are families that were more than capable of running their own lives up until um, a month ago so we want to be empowering them to um, start again in the UK and um, so if we can do that within a structured environment and a supportive mm. environment then life is going to be that much easier for them 
Thank you. As they said in the UK. Thank you, Annie. We're having some sound issues. I'm sorry about that, everyone. We uh, put put this on this event on very quickly, uh, so we want to get as much information as we can to you. I hope you're hearing some of the messages. Think these things through. Six months is a long time. It's going to affect your family. Talk it through with your family. Um, there are safeguarding checks that will need to take place. So it's very likely, again, the government isn't clear yet, but it's very likely you're going to have to have a DBS check. If you haven't passed your DBS check, sadly, at this stage, you're not likely to be ready to be able to receive a refugee family. And, and look, this is important. This isn't just some paperwork. This is vulnerable people coming from a war zone. And so it's not right for us to put them somewhere. We have a duty of care to make sure they're safe. Look, I, I come from the world of fostering. That, that's what our family does. And uh, we're adoptive parents. And children have had the most difficult start in life. We need to make sure it's safe for them to go to a new family. It's the same mindset. So it, it, it's interesting, isn't it? There's so much energy, which is brilliant. But I guess we need to be a bit patient. The system is not all it should be. We need to be patient with it. And imagine the patience that our Ukrainian friends have had to show. You know, I was speaking to Olga earlier on, and uh, she had to wait hours and hours to get through a border. Some people have been waiting three days. So, you know, we'll be patient in order to offer the best support that we can. Uh, brilliant. Well, th thank you both for joining us. Um, I need, please, there's lots of really helpful questions in the chat uh, that, that you might be able to help with as well. It's really great. We're grateful for Upbeat Communities and what they've been doing. Um, we're going to um, go to talking about looking after uh, someone who has experience looking after refugees. And we've got Rachel Poulton joining us uh, all the way from the north west of England. So uh, good. Thank you again, Simon. Thank you, uh, Ione. We'll catch you later. Oh, Rachel, well done. You, you've uh, decided yellow and blue, just like me. You're looking great. And you did a great job the other day on BBC Breakfast, Radio 4, Radio 5 Live. You've been doing a great job. T tell us, Rachel, there'll be people here that aren't certain that they're up for this. They, they, they might feel ill-equipped to be able to care for a family coming from a war zone. You've been looking after children and young people who have come from places like Afghanistan and South Sudan. What do people need to know? How, how can they prepare themselves to help people with that kind of trauma? Yeah, for the past five and a half years, we've been caring for <clears throat> teenage refugees who've all come from extremely difficult um, situations and have suffered trauma, every one of them. And I think I, I still feel nervous. I'm not an expert. I'm not a therapist. I, I don't have, I love calling on those professionals and listening to their advice. And there's probably lots of people listening to this far better equipped than me. We're an ordinary family, but that's actually what we can offer. So when people arrive in our home, I just want them to feel welcome and to feel safe. Those are the two priorities. And we try and make it very clear on that first day, you know, we just say, oh, we're so glad you're here. And we keep it very calm and very gentle and we don't ask questions and we feel our way. And yes, you know, even though we've had quite a few through, we've got some with us now, um, you know, I, I still do feel nervous, but there is help available. And I just think if it comes from the heart, um, that shows and, and people begin to relax. And I love to see that. Mm -hmm. Really helpful. Um, some some questions here um, in the chat I'm looking at, and I think you can help us with your experience. Uh, someone's asked, you know, we're all DBS checked, we're foster carers, we're teachers, but actually our fostering agency has said we can't do this. Um, you are someone that has fostering experience. Can, can you help us? Is that is that very authority to authority? or? I, yeah, I should imagine it will. I mean, for ourselves, we're fortunate in that the room we're going to offer to um, hopefully a Ukrainian refugee family is actually slightly separate from the house. So we, we should be okay on that score. But I'm afraid I think people will have to be guided by their local authority on that. Um, and, and it is part of the whole household agreeing that this is something they want to do. And for us, that's very important, having that evening meal together every night. You know, we've had We've got six teenagers in the house at the moment. And this evening we were sat around the table. I was just explaining, you know, guys, please be careful with the Wi-Fi because um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it better not crash tonight. Um, and, and just to have everyone feeling, I think everyone contributing as well as receiving. I think that's an important part of, of welcoming a family too. 
Really good. I'm sensing in some of the comments there's, there's a real impatience. People have been waiting a long time to help, and it seems like that patience is running out. What's your advice? I, I know you've had to have your own fights, you know, contending for the rights of the children in your care. How, how do we help people? Impatience is a good thing in that it motivates us forward, but, you know, how do we stop that kind of spilling over into frustration? Yeah, I'd say channel it. You know, I've been in lots of meetings with various professionals and often if there's a young person in a really distressing situation or coming from a, a, you know, a, a situation where they've been tortured perhaps, in you know, the terrible things they've experienced, there's a kind of anger that generates in all of us. And sometimes you see that anger just being sort of ricocheting around the room as people almost attack each other. And I think recognizing you know, this is a terrible thing but let's work together. And we really, really work hard at making sure we have good relationships with every one of the professionals involved. We have a fantastic surgery, the mm. health service locally. I've got a lovely dentist with the kids and the local schools have been absolutely brilliant. And I would just say work together. Yeah, you know, we yeah. Don't need to compete. We I don't love need that. To be the favorite person. You know, everyone just works together. And actually, it can go really, really well. And that's been our experience. Yes, good. Channeling frustration is such a good idea because shouting at the TV or getting angry on Twitter, that actually doesn't change anything. And you might feel a little bit better having shouted, but you haven't actually helped any refugees get here. This system was not designed by us. It's the government that's designed it. We've used our pressure, positive pressure, by cheering them on and saying, look, here we are, thousands of people ready to go. That That's really helpful, Rachel. Let's channel our anger into actually delivering something. And I, I think that's so helpful. I'm, I'm gonna bring in Kat Ross uh, now. Um, Kat, you're someone that gets frustrated, but you turn it into something positive. Uh, your organization is a network of I think 50, if I'm right, is that right? 50, 55. Baby. 55, oh, we're so close. Um, tell us how we can channel that frustration into something positive. What could people do now? And um, you, you, you put an appeal out just, just this evening, I think. Yeah, so um, we're, we're a national network of baby banks. We support vulnerable people right across the UK who are in need of support for um, essential items for children from naught to five years old. And what I would really encourage people to think about um, when they're thinking about whether they can host a Ukrainian family is kind of what makeup of family are you able to take into your home? So are you thinking you want to potentially host young adults? So you think you want to host a family with young children and think through some of the practicalities of things that you are gonna need in place. Um, and that's partly where we can help um, through Sanctuary Foundation and there'll be information coming onto the website soon for those practical essentials. So if you're thinking you've got space to take a family with under fives in, we can help provide the cots, the toys, the safe equipment, so that we're ensuring that every child's got a safe space to sleep when they when they come to stay with you. Um, but also think through some of those other practicalities um, about what they're gonna need. They're gonna need to register in a school, they're gonna need a GP, they might need um, a health visitor, or even a midwife if the woman that mm. you bring in is pregnant. You can start to find all the ways that you need to register these families with in advance so that when they arrive with you, you can get all the statutory support that is needed for them available to them straight away. And I think the crucial thing is to remember that these families, when they come in, these people, when they come in from, from Ukraine, yes, we're sponsoring them, but they will have leave to remain for three years, which means they get access to our benefits they get access yes. to our nhs um, but that we know that living on universal credit is often not enough for a family in the uk so there is going to be additional support that they need so i would encourage you to get in contact with your local charities such as your baby bank such as your clothing bank such as your food bank that can help support the families as they settle and, and re-establish themselves in the uk that's so helpful, Kat. There's stuff that we can prepare as hosts in advance that if we wait until people come, we'll slow things down. So finding out how it works for your schools, your Jeep, brilliant, really helpful. We can all do that uh, in advance. That, that's excellent. Um, Kat, we, we think that many of the families coming are going to be women with younger children. We know that um, men can't come uh, unless they're over 60, I think, is the, the cutoff limit. Um, so we might be looking around our houses and seeing are they safe 
for a child to come into. Um, I think we're going to be putting up some advice on the Sanctuary Foundation website in the next day or so, hopefully tomorrow if I get on my flight to Moldova. Um, the, uh, so there are things that you could begin to just look in your house. That's what foster carers have to do before they welcome vulnerable children. We have to think, think through the eyes of a child, you know, uh, plug sockets, all that kind of stuff. So you, there are things that are good to do anyway, but make you prepared. That That's excellent. Um, great. Kat, any other ideas for us? What, what else do you think we could be doing? I, I've seen you in action with the Afghan refugees, and it, it was those practical items you know we, we had a, an amazon wish list up didn't we at one stage yeah and uh, we've got the same as our amazon wish list now open for ukraine support as well so that we're prepared to support host families with the practical equipment they need so it's thinking through especially for under fives safe space to sleep so moses basket up to four months old with brand new mattress and appropriate bedding cots toddler beds if you've got a single bed but you're thinking it might house a child under seven years old do you need a bed guard for that high chairs feeding equipment having plastic cups not glasses all of really really practical things but they make such a difference to that child's life and to that mum's life when she comes because she knows it's been already thought of she can content concentrate and making sure that her child feels safe and loved in a new environment so it's kind of thinking those practical things through and it says to that family that you're welcoming we've thought of it we really are welcoming you not just any ukrainian family we're welcoming mm -hmm. you and we've thought about your personal needs really helpful i was on um breakfast tv with uh, rachel on monday i think it was and uh, we, we wore our yellow and blue as our kind of sign of being with the people and um we said a little prayer before we went in because we were all a bit nervous and after we'd been on air uh, the floor manager came up uh, to Rachel, I think, wasn't it? And she she said, look, I've, I've signed up. And, uh, you know, while we were on air, even the person in the room signed up and she was Googling Ukrainian recipes so that she could be ready to be able to receive a Ukrainian family. I, I, I want to cook them something that will make them feel at home. That, that thinking through in advance, that empathy, what are these people going to have been through? How can I make sure my house and my cuisine and my posture and my attitude is going to be welcoming? Uh, it's another reason we need to dial down some of the anger. Uh, that's not going to be a, a really positive thing to come into. If we're just angry, surely we've got to be welcoming. And that means being a non-anxious presence, being ready to welcome people, uh, putting our own emotions aside so that we can focus on the emotions of someone else. Those are the sort of things that you learn as a foster parent, as a carer, as a refugee host. Uh, Rachel, just back to you. Anything else you think people should be thinking through as they prepare to welcome someone yeah. from Ukraine? Yeah, I think there are, there are an awful lot of things, but I would also say you don't have to be perfect. Just be really warm, be really welcoming, be calm. And I think those first few days are often crucial. You know, with teenagers, we always just have a few chocolate bars on the bed. We have a little card with the person's name on that we make. It's a homemade thing that we do for each one. And they've told me afterwards when we've said, you know, what, what did it first feel like here? You know, how weird was it? Um, they, they have often said, actually, those little things um, meant a lot. We don't ask questions. We don't need to know their whole story. We just take it day by day, little bit by little bit. Oh, do you want to play Uno? OK, let's let's kick a ball outside, guys, or whatever it is. But just plug into their interests. And I think also, remember, not just to view this person as a refugee, we have teenagers in our home. They're also teenagers. They're kind mm. of exploring their own identity. They, you know, we've got someone learning piano at the moment, another one on guitar and, you know, dance. There's, there's other sides to them. So just remember this is still a person. I, I think sometimes refugee can make people kind of view a little bit differently. One last tip is you will be inundated with people wanting to give you clothing, probably. <laughs> just check that out and think about it. Does it feel nice to always be wearing someone else's clothes? I mean, my, myself, this is like in a charity shop, but does that feel nice? Um, I actually say to people now, actually a voucher for Sports Direct would be great, you know, because <laughs> I, I like them to, we, we take them shopping and they buy their own stuff. Um, Good. Thoughts, it's about but, dignity, isn't it, Rachel? Yeah, that's, that's so helpful yeah. that we don't just label someone, stigmatize someone. Here's Here's my refugee, um, exactly. as if it's some kind of um, 
you know, yeah. uh, item, you know. That, that, that doesn't that's, feel that's nice and help them contribute as well to the household. Really I mean, good. Everyone can do something. And that's good. We, we talk a lot about um, agency, giving people decision making power, um, because, you know, would I want just people to, to give me stuff and then make decisions about my life? Uh, same same with questions about cooking. Uh, many of the families that I know that are from Afghanistan that are in hotels and temporary accommodation, they want to be able to cook their own food. They, they want to be able to take control of their diet, and I would too. Um, so giving people that decision-making power, not making decisions for them, but involving them in the conversation. We, we have a, a little expression that we use in the work I do, nothing about us without us. So, you know, if you're making a decision, involve them in it so that they can have a chance to shape what actually happens. That's really good advice, uh, Rachel, about the dignity. Now, we have uh, another guest to bring in. Uh, it's great to have Catherine Wesaf, Catherine Gladwell. Uh, Catherine and I have worked together for many years. And Catherine, you're newly branded, although, you know, long-running charity at Refugee Education has been working with uh, young adults uh, who have entered the education system, often unaccompanied asylum seeking children, but really want to learn your wisdom for helping us get ready for some of these children. We know that 70,000 child refugees a day have been generated by this crisis. Most of them are not unaccompanied, they're coming with parents, but, but what is it we can do as hosts to make sure particularly the children are going to be settled in and you know what, what what should be our priority yeah thank you so much Chris um so like Chris said we're a national charity um and we exist to help refugee children and young people get into education so that's right from primary level at the outset all the way up to university and then to be able to really thrive whilst they're there um and so what do we know about refugee children arriving in the UK and how can we um, best support them? I think the first thing that I would repeat is that we know that they will have had distressing and traumatic experiences and that has been spoken about already tonight. Um, but we also know that in that context, refugee children prioritise education and that's even in the acute stages of conflict and in the immediate stages of being in a host country. And uh, sometimes I joke that if I had kind of a pound for every time a refugee child had said to me when can I start school or when can I get into college we would never have to do any kind of fundraising activity again because it happens so frequently um, and really getting back into school as soon as possible even if they are not here permanently or long term um, and into places where they will be well supportive is one of the best and most effective ways for children and young people to begin the process of rebuilding. Um, so that's not just about the crucial learning that they're then not missing out on, but it's about having a normalizing routine, about being able to make friends, about being able to play, you know, all of the things that we know are essential for kids. Um, and yet we also know that at the moment, newly arriving refugee children can wait up to nine months um, for a school place. So there is a lot that needs to be done, um, but there are some key things um, in that context that we can do and that those of us who are supporting Ukrainians over the coming weeks and months can do um, to support their education. Um, so I'm happy, to, I'm happy to run through a few of those practicalities if you like. Yeah, do, please. Um, so I think, um, I'll just touch on three key things. Um, the first would be providing an initial welcome um, that relates to navigating the system. Um, I think any of you who've got kids um, and have kind of access to the school application and uh, FE college system will know that it's confusing at the best of times, even when you're operating in a context that you're familiar with and in your mother tongue. And um, if that's not the case, it can be really overwhelming. Um, and even before this current crisis, our team, um, our team is always overwhelmed by inquiries from refugees in the UK, um, from Afghanistan, from Syria, from many other conflicts about how to get into education. So that initial kind of information support and guidance piece is key. Um, and in terms of how we can help practically, um, we'll be producing education welcome packs. Um, we did that for Afghan new arrivals. We'll now be doing it for Ukrainians. Um, we'll also be launching a national education welcome helpline that will be open daily, um, that will be able to respond um, to any questions that new arrivals have about how to get into education um, in this context. Um, and so this kind of first phase is all about helping people get in the door at the appropriate level of education to them. 
Um, the second thing I would say, and I, um, I imagine that we've got a number of people um, on this call today who work in schools, who are teachers or teaching assistants or engage in education in some other capacity, um, is that we really need to, at a structural level to be supporting our own education system. So supporting our schools, our colleges and our universities to respond as best they can to the new learners that they will be receiving. Um, so if you're in that position today, um, we'll also be rolling out a free of introductory online training in supporting refugee children um, in education uh, and that will be widely available and that will provide lots of practical tips um, that we don't have the time for tonight um, and then the third piece is really around supporting continued learning of those children and young adults for as long as they're here um, and in some places where we work that looks like um, educational mentoring so we're looking at how we can ramp that up um, to offer online educational mentoring to larger numbers um, of new arrivals. Um, but also kind of at the other end of the spectrum, um, universities, how can universities make the most of this um, Homes for Ukraine scheme to offer support, accommodation um, and including scholarships if needed to Ukrainian students? Um, and so we're gathering data on that at the moment. Um, and so I think in that context of those three things, I guess what I would want to leave you with this evening is uh, just a kind of call to say if you are going to end up hosting refugee children and young people, um, think about education. You'll remember that when you were a child and when you were a teenager, school is like the biggest thing in your life. Um, that doesn't change just because you're a refugee child. Um, so call the helpline that we'll be launching for education support um, when you have things that people are struggling to grapple with. Um, and in due course, there'll be loads of volunteering opportunities too um, in the education space for those who can't actually host. That's so helpful, Catherine, and, and we'll make your um, helpline available. Uh, we'll send an email to everybody. Uh, some of you are asking if this is recorded. It is recorded and will be available for you to watch afterwards. We'll send you a link uh, probably tomorrow. Um, few questions coming around, you know, what, what can I do if I can't host? Catherine's given us a good uh, first step. You can definitely volunteer in your local school if they're starting to receive uh, refugee children. Many will already have refugee children. Um, Ukrainians, we love them to bits. We're going to do everything we can to help them. But there are lots of Afghan children that are here. There are lots of children from uh, Eritrea and South Sudan. And each one of them as valuable as your kids or my kids. So, um, you know, we're not showing favoritism to the Ukrainians. It is the most urgent need right now. Uh, if you think about the number of refugees that have been generated by this crisis, I think people are talking about three million at the moment. Um, that is double the amount of refugees that came out of the whole Syrian crisis over two years. And we've only had three weeks. So this is absolutely huge and it's on our doorstep. That's why we're focusing on Ukraine. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you, Kat. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Um, you've heard a focus there on uh, talking about children because most of the refugees that come here are likely to be children. With mums, it's often a, a family of a mum and two kids. Um, it's true that some of the elderly will come, but I've been speaking to my Ukrainian friends and some of the elderly don't want to leave. So um, we still think the vast majority are going to be children and uh, mothers. Uh, we're going to hear it now from another panel and we're going to get to throw some of the questions you've been asking about the systems. How do the systems work? What can we actually do? Um, what's coming next? You're going to get a chance to ask those questions. And uh, so it's great to invite uh, my guests back in. I think we're going to be joined by um, Monica from Reset. Good to see you. And uh, who else is joining us? I think we've got one more person come in. Iron ear, brilliant. I hope we've did we managed to sort out your sound. I hope so. We'll find out. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Iron ear, thank you for persevering with us. Uh, Monica, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what Reset does? Uh, I've been delighted at the Sanctuary Foundation to be working hand in glove with you guys. Uh, tell us a little bit about what Reset does. Oh, thank you, Chris. And can I first just say how excited I am to be here with you all tonight? We've been absolutely overwhelmed at Reset in the last couple of weeks by the massive upswell of interest and support from public across the UK to get involved in this issue. And I know there are thousands of people on this call tonight. And I really would just want to say to every one of you, thank you for your engagement. Thank you for taking notice. Thank you for caring. And thank you for being interested, because that is how 
transformation happens. We just each take notice. So thank you for that. So yes, I'm uh, Monica Cruzman, co-director of Reset Communities and Refugees. We are a charity that's been working for the last five years to develop and grow the community sponsorship movement across the UK. And uh, some of you may have had an experience of that. Um, community sponsorship in its most simple form is where a group of people in a neighborhood come together and they take charge of welcoming a refugee family. They don't host that's something that's really important and really different about community sponsorship compared with the new humanitarian sponsorship pathway. But they do lots and lots of other things. So they do secure housing. Uh, the, the, the refugee family will pay for the housing from their benefits, but they do secure the housing. They'll make a resettlement plan, doing all of those things that we've talked about, like finding out how if the family's got children, how can we get them in, in touch with schools? How can we get connected with benefits? How can we get them enrolled with doctor surgery? And then after the family arrives, the community sponsorship group will have have a role supporting them through their first year of, of settling in the UK. Um, and it's just a massive privilege to work in this movement because we see so often the absolute transformation that happens not just for the newcomers who join you know who join our communities and become part of our lives in the UK but the transformation that this uh, this this catalyzes in the people who do the welcoming mm, we've had so yeah. many stories of people coming forward to us and saying do you know what this was hard work but this was one of the best things I've ever done in my life this has changed my life in so many different ways i have more connected to my community I know things about my community that I didn't know before I've met new friends you know I found out all kinds of things so it's something really transformative that happens in communities and for people who are welcoming as well as the people who come to us so I think for us what I'd really point to in these kind of welcoming situations is that there's the potential for an extraordinary mutual experience here you know it's not just about giving in one direction this is an exchange and if we uh, you know if, for those of us who might be welcoming people into our homes it's going to be a really intense exchange but it has the potential to be one of the most extraordinary things that's ever happened in your life. Amen. Well said. So, M Monica, quite a few questions about yeah. um, the different phases, I guess. You know, we, we're hearing, and again, we, we're in some of those conversations with government. Uh, I've been working with the civil servants who've literally been working round the clock. Yes. I, I, you know, I, I saw a guy today who was heading up the programme and he looked absolutely yeah. exhausted. He's just been working so hard. And... Um, so, you know, we're in those conversations, but in the end, it's the government that makes the decisions about what gets rolled out. Having you guys with us, you know, signing up on the Sanctuary Foundation gives a lot of weight and it accelerates the government to do something. When you've got 23,000 people queuing or 100,000 on the government's website queuing up, it encourages them to do something more quickly. So that's the first thing you could do, go and queue up, tell them that you're ready, right? Second thing, I guess the question is, Phase one, we've been hearing, seems to be a focus on mm -hmm. um, you know someone in Ukraine, you've got a house, and therefore that, that connection can happen. What about those people that don't know anybody? When we polled our, our database of thousands of people that were ready, most people don't know anybody. What happens about matching? I think you've got some exciting news that you can share. Right. Right, Chris. Thank you. That's a really, really important question. So you're right that at the first phase, the government has been focusing on connecting people who already have a name to match. So they can put in the name. This is my name. This is the person, the name of the person, the details they want to sponsor. That is the first priority. At Reset, one of the things that we, like so many people, have been really concerned about is the fact that most people who've stepped forward to help don't yet have somebody that they can name. So we've been working uh, really intensively in the last few days to set up a matching interface. And this is a website. It is live. It is available. Um, and I'm going to give you the uh, address. And I imagine, Chris you, Chris, you can send it around later. The website yeah, yeah, we can is... put it, in the, it directly in the chat. So you just say it and they'll put it in the chat for people. Let's to be pop able it in the on. chat. Great. So it's www.homesforukraine.org.uk. And what we've got there is a portal where you've got a chance for people at this end to say what it is that they have to give, what hosting arrangement they could give. And we've got the function for refugees at the other end to be able to say, this is what I need. This is my, you know, the kind of family that I am. This is the kind of the, the setup that I'm coming from. And this is what I need. Now, at the moment, the website has only just launched a day or two ago. So we are at that kind of stage of, of um, being able to get the data in there, start registering people. What is really important then is the work that's coming now, which is to match. And that is really important that we do that safely, 
and responsibly. So we are working with other organizations to make sure and we'll take the time that's needed to make sure that we can do safe and responsible matches that have the best possible opportunity of working out well. So that is, uh, but that is that is how, you know, something practical you can do if you don't know somebody that you would like to sponsor and you want to be matched. So this is a portal, a practical place where you can go and start getting into that process. Brilliant. So, you know, three things you need to do digitally, sign on to the government website, <laughs> let them know you're there, sign up with Sanctuary Foundation and we can let you know about all the training that we've got coming up and put your name into homesforukraine.org.uk and we can begin to match. Maybe you know Ukrainians that need to be matched, stick them in the other side and then we'll see how this works. It's taken a while from the government side to decide what we're going to do and these guys have turned something around very, very quickly because we want to keep everybody safe. We want to keep you as safe as possible, but we also want to keep Ukrainians as safe as possible. That's why you need a bit of patience. So this system is going to work. So brilliant. Okay, Monica. Um, so let's say I don't have any room in my house. Um, and, you know, some of us have, have bigger houses than others. I don't have any room in my house. Oh, actually, I've got a previous question to that. Some people are asking if I live in a rural context. I'm not in a big city. There aren't likely to be other Ukrainian families. Um, you know, not many Ukrainian or even Russian speakers because some parts of Ukraine they don't they, they speak Russian. Not many people like that. Would that preclude me from being a host? It would absolutely not preclude you from being a host. From community sponsorship, we've had lots of examples of really successful re, uh, rural resettlement of refugee families and refugees. So it's absolutely possible to do it if you're in a rural setting. What I would say is more, uh, you know, when we've talked about it earlier in the call, the importance of research and preparing beforehand. So I would say absolutely take the time to have a really good think about what the commitment is, what are the needs of the people who you'll be welcoming into your community and really research your community and really think about, well, Will my people? Will 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 the people that I'm going to be welcoming have particular? Um, you know, if they they might have need halal food. Will they have particular medical needs? Will they have particular transport and access needs? Can my community provide the things that the people we're going to be welcoming uh, need? And if the answer uh, you do the research and the answer is yes, then absolutely crack on because we have some seen some of the most beautiful mm. welcoming stories from really quite isolated places which yes. don't have a history of resettlement. And I think that's one of the beautiful and magic things about community-led welcoming because it's for everybody. You don't have to be in a metro yes. centre where there's lots and lots of history of resettlement. You can be yeah. in you know all yeah. kinds of other places. So totally possible. That's right. And again, I would put this in the framing of an evacuation, that the most important thing is that Ukrainians need somewhere safe to come because we're seeing the pictures from places like Warsaw where there just isn't enough room and the Polish government have asked for help from other nations. So if we make space available, it allows people from Ukraine to come out. I, I was on um, Telegram um, oh, I'm all down with the kids, right? That, that's a that's a social media networking thing that's <laughs> popular in Ukraine. And um, a young woman was saying, look, I, I'm still in Ukraine because I can't think of where to go. If she knew there was somewhere safe in the UK, she could come, then she could leave. So providing a safe space in a rural context, maybe it doesn't tick every box that would be wonderful, but this is an evacuation. And as Simon said earlier, don't let the perfect uh, rule out um uh, the imperfect so you know the good sorry don't let the imperfect rule out the good the good thing is to offer a place so don't let your rural context stop you uh, great okay what about this one then um, and maybe Aini you've got a uh, comment on this as well um, tell us more about community sponsorship because not all of us have room in our house and it's promised from the government that this is phase one we're expecting phase two to be open to a wider group of people um, so maybe Ionia, you've had some experience of community sponsorship as well. Um, Upbeat has mostly worked with local councils to do resettlement. Um, although we have provided, in addition to the work that Re Reset are doing through relationships, we have been able to support local community sponsorships as they go through the process and grapple with what it means to navigate universal credit, et cetera. Um, so yes, and in terms of rural settings, we might not think they're ideal because they're not near the sort of the glitzy cities, but um, there is often a warm welcome in, in rural 
um, settings where there is a real community feel that already exists that a family can land into. So yes. please don't rule yourselves out if you live rurally. Thank you. Um, I'm seeing a couple of questions about the website that it seems to forward you to a go the Gov website. It, it, am I? Maybe I'm, I'm misreading that. Someone might want to look into that and see if we've got that right. I don't know. Just uh, one thing. So um, my magical head of operations, Carly, is whispering in my ear and just making sure I clarify for you all that at the moment, so the part of our website, the matching website, which is ready and raring to go, is the site for collecting refugee details from the other end. Um, so, so yeah, do go on that site. But it might be that if you're trying to uh, register your refu your details as a sponsor, it might be redirecting you into the web, the um, uh, the government website. Tech, okay. sorry, we're sorting. No, it out. no, it's fine. Everyone's working at pace, and we we uh, we're grateful for you. Um, now, I, I don't know about you, but I, I was a bit shocked, maybe frustrated, with some of the messaging over the weekend that this is all about money. I don't know if you saw. The front page of most of the newspapers, government releases scheme £350 to host a refugee. Um, and you know, I, I don't think it's wrong that the government might give a little bit of support to help families to be able to do this. We've got a huge cost in living increase at the moment. But some people seem to understand it as a payment. And they're saying, well, this it doesn't meet my needs. And somehow it's kind of maybe polluted some of the, uh, the altruism that's there. Um, when we first launched um, the Sanctuary Foundation, uh, we were imagining it would be very similar to community sponsorship, where you actually have to raise money in order to be able to welcome a refugee. So this is the first time our government, I think any government, has paid families to host refugees. Um, so there's quite a few questions about that. Um, can, can anyone explain? Do we know if this is going to impact your benefits, if you're on benefit, uh, do we know anything about the tax status of this or is that still to be worked out? It is. Uh, there, are, there are still a lot of details to be worked out. I know that is part of the live conversations at the moment. Uh, I think the intention is certainly that it would not impact benefits. It would not have a detrimental tax status, but that is still being worked out is one of the many details we are still waiting on government to clarify. Great. And I know I've, I've phoned you a few times and you've been on your way to the airport to pick people up. Um, it sounds like we're going to need those skills again. Um, what have you heard about the transport of refugees to the UK? Um, in terms of Ukrainians, very little. Uh, we were at the airport yesterday uh, welcoming um, a family as part of the UK resettlement, which is existed i think since 2015 um so we relatively regularly uh, go to the airport uh, welcome a family who have arrived from um, overseas and then we provide transport and accompany them to their new home um, which is what we did yesterday and that is always a privilege pretty emotional and families are overcome with emotion themselves and um, yesterday was a family of five and the, um, on the way back, the dad was asking, where can we get him a car? And the youngest daughter, who was eight, spent most of the time crying because she was missing her grandma. Oh. Um, so these, these are the realities of what we're facing when we welcome a family. And we need to be ready, ready for that. That's right. M Monica, if I'm hearing the government right, the host family has some responsibility or the host household has responsibility to bring the refugees here. Uh, and I've heard some offers of free flights from some of the countries and surrounding nations. Do you have any more clarity on that? I think it is quite a mixed picture at the moment. Our understanding is certainly that generally there would be an expectation that hosts would look at helping with the transport. On the other hand, we know that there are some um, uh, airline companies, for example, who are offering free flights. So I think it will be quite a mixed situation um, uh, in, terms of, in terms of that. And I think it's evolving really quickly. I think that's good because I think that there will be lots of options. Uh, and I think that, you know, we'll be able to, for each individual circumstance, there will be different options and there'll be different ways that we can, you know, meet the needs of, the, of that particular uh, uh, um, newcomer. Really good. And, and the good thing is um, your uh, flights from Eastern Europe are relatively cheap there are, there's a lot of budget airlines that can kind of help us there and i've seen some online 
uh, information about some of the companies offering free flights for refugees. So kind of watch that carefully. Again, th this is about an emergency situation. If I was in the shoes of a Ukrainian family and I'm a dad and I've got to stay behind and fight, what would I want a host to do for my family? I want them to take the pain out of that journey. Um, I'd want them to make it as easy as possible for my family to arrive in the country and to be looked after well. All those things we were hearing earlier about empathy are absolutely vital here. So again, thinking in advance what it's going to take. Um, just we've had some clarity on the website issue. So if you can get that website out towards uh, friends in Ukraine that need to come here, that's where we need to go first. Your first port of call as a, if you're a Brit, is to go to the government website and fill your details in there and to go to the Sanctuary Foundation so that we can keep you informed on as how things are coming. Um, we will put every single bit of information we have onto the Sanctuary Foundation website. Some of you have been asking for checklists. Uh, that's really helpful. So we'll, um, we'll create some checklists based on some of the things you've been hearing tonight. And it is fast evolving. We're trying to keep you as informed as we can as we've said, everything has been developed at pace. So, you know, that, that's important. Yeah. Um, do, does someone need to own a house in order to be a host? Do you know, does anyone know if you can be a renter and allow a refugee to come and live in your house? Does anyone know that? That is an excellent question question Krish and I have to say I don't know with any certainty the answer I think that uh do you know what I'm not gonna I'm not gonna guess I don't know. <laughs> look that's good that shows you're uh, you're not a blaggy when we we know when you say when you don't know we know you're speaking the truth when you say when you do know so thanks for that humility I know from your experience I of hosting what can you tell us uh, just to answer that question that previous question I would suggest that if you are not the homeowner that you speak to the homeowner or the housing provider um, and check with them what the restrictions are if any on you having a guest on a more permanent basis to stay fantastic and some of you that are um are renting yeah you do chat chat with the landlord um sometimes uh your a uh, mortgage provider might have a view on things as well. We've seen that with people that wanted to rent houses out to um, refugees, not the house that you're living in, but renting another house out. And some mortgage companies don't allow that to take place. Um, let, let's let's keep pushing on that. What else could we do front? So I don't own, let's say I don't own a house. Um, I don't have room in my house um, and I still want to be involved. What, what do we think is likely to be rolled out? Again, we're guessing here ahead of the government um, re revealing these things. What is likely to be available for churches and businesses? What could they be doing right now, Monica? So I, I think that I'd probably just repeat what, what a lot of our guests have said tonight, which is to say, research your local community. So go out, find out what's happening in your local area. Because what we do know is that communities across the, uh, the UK are really dynamic in their welcoming spaces contact your local city of sanctuary group find out what's happening find out what other refugee welcome activities are going on and just see what other options are there because i think it's really likely that even if you find out eventually this isn't quite the right thing for you there will totally be something that is right for you and that will meet your circumstances so i'd say really go and research your community find out what's happening Lots of people have said that Ukraine is the pressing issue at the moment, but actually, you know, there are lots of other refugees, there are lots of other people in deep need in this country already here. And mm. there, are, there are loads and loads of ways to get, in contact, to, to get in contact with the groups and the charities who are supporting them, you know, and that is, that is just as valuable a way of, of giving your heart and giving your time and your resource to people who need it. So do research what's happening locally and, and I really think you'll find something which is right for you. Thank you. Uh, the question here, I'll, I'll have a go at answering. Um, what can church leaders do? I, I, I'm part of my church, so maybe I can help with that. Uh, I would say there are three things a church leader could do. Uh, number one is sign your church up at Sanctuary Foundation. 1,200 plus churches have done so already. So as soon as that community sponsorship route is open, we can involve you. Uh, we are planning a church leaders event uh, in the next week or so. Watch your inbox. Um, we're also planning a similar event for businesses that want to get involved. We've had a number of businesses say we are ready. And again, just chatting to Olga over dinner, um, loads of Ukrainians she knows don't want to come here until they know there's work available for them. And we've had offers already. Uh, the fabulous people at Cook 
Uh, I don't think I've ever eaten a cooked meal. They look so posh and nice. I'm going to go and get one so I can eat one. But the, the people at Cook have got some spaces, for example, on their um, you know raw talent program, which is going to help people into work. And they're going to partner with their local community or local church to provide the wraparound support. So some of these things, oh, my goodness, I'm going to use a terrible metaphor. We're pre-cooking ahead of the government opening the scheme, we're devising these ideas to be able to feed into the system. What we're seeing is incredibly hard work in civil servants, but the bandwidth for imagination, actually that's stuff that we can do. We can we can do that for them and feed that in. So um, businesses, there's stuff you can do. You register with us and we'll let you know. Uh, same with uh, churches. We've been having a number of neighborhood groups register which is lovely but most of us uh, were part of whatsapp groups in lockdown weren't we we're all our neighbors we're on run group together uh, we think this was an idea from Kathleen moran the times columnist uh, we think this could be a wonderful way when the community sponsorship route opens for a community to wrap around because you've been doing that already you're just increasing your tent if you like you're allowing other people into that and you've already been modeling it wouldn't it be fantastic uh, to be able to offer that uh, to a Ukrainian family. So um, this is phase one, okay? I get excited. We're not leaving tonight on a cliffhanger uh, because we don't know what phase two is, but we have been promised phase two is coming. And hang in there. Let's channel that energy. I'm so pleased that there's so much energy in this room that you want to help. Let's channel it into some of those ways uh, we've been hearing throughout this evening. Um, I was on a train the other day. I think I've spent most of my last week on a train, either going up to Manchester or not for the BBC. And um, there was a, a young woman on a, another train. She was on a train from Ukraine to Poland. And um, we were messaging each other on Telegram. Uh, I tried phoning her, but partly because of the signal and partly because my Ukrainian is terrible, uh, we were really struggling to communicate. But she told me that her train had to be stopped because there was a rocket attack. And uh, suddenly I'm getting no communication at all. And, and I'm impatient, right? I am angry. I think, what can I do? I want to do something. And, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to think. And I, I don't know. Uh, this is some of my background. I know we've got all different backgrounds here. Um, I, I just took a punt and, and I found some words in Ukrainian that I thought might be meaningful to her. You know, faith is part of my life. A lot of Ukrainians have faith too. So I, I found some Ukrainian words uh, from a book in the Bible, the Psalms, and I sent it to her. I said, I can't, I can't get through to you. Maybe this could be some comfort to you. And, um, you know, I was so pleased she messaged back. A, she was alive. That was great. But B, she said, look, this... This does mean something to me. Faith is important to me. And these words give me hope. So, friends, whatever contact you can have with people in Ukraine, positive message you can send them, uh, whether we're going to do our yellow and blue, I'll send you a, a message, or whether it's putting on crochet flowers. I've got the team at GB News wearing their crochet flowers today. Uh, first time I've ever been to GB News. I wasn't expecting to ever go there. But here we are talking about welcoming refugees. The mood is changing. And so I would say... In lieu of you being able to actually host someone, let's use the power that we have to reach out to Ukrainians on social media, let them know we're for them. Uh, use your voice on Twitter and social media to let the world know they can sign up. Get more people to sign up for the government scheme and Ukrainians into the reset scheme. And if you want to be handheld through this process, as we have information, we'll be passing that on to you. So get onto Sanctuary Foundation. Uh, some of you might want to be fundraising. That's great. You know, do, get, get some money going. They need money in Ukraine and they need money at the borders. Organizations like World Vision and the Red Cross are there. Those are really positive things you could be doing that send huge messages of love and compassion out there. But whatever you do, do something. And we're just so grateful that you've been able to be with us. We have a little uh, survey for you. Uh, and again, what we found is our survey data has been helping to inform government policy. So when we surveyed everyone, 97.8% of people didn't know anyone in Ukraine. So that was really helpful for the Home Office to know. And um, so we have another survey. We're going to put it in the chat now. Uh, it would really help us if you fill it in because it helps us know who you are and the kind of things that you're waiting for. If we hear that lots of you don't have housing, great. That helps us to know we really need to be stepping up phase two and three soon. So do fill that in. But keep going. You're doing a great job. Can I just uh, bring as many of my guests as I can back onto the screen uh, to say thank you? 
Simon Thomas, thank you to you uh, for Thanks, being Rick. a great and wonderful advocate for refugees from Ukraine. Catherine, we're grateful for the work that you're doing and have been doing in schools. And we recognize so many of the um, refugees coming in children. Kat Ross, uh, your Amazon wish list. Let's get that in the uh, the chat as soon as we can so people can start giving to that. So we're ready with stuff as it's needed. Um, great you. to have Monica, of course, with all your expertise and reset. Ainia, thank you for persevering through difficult times with uh, the sound. And we're grateful that you brought a cat to this event. <laughs> and we love the work that you're doing as hosting service. And Rachel Poulton, you have the best outfit of all of us, flying the uh, Ukrainian flag. We're grateful for you. And what a household you have, an international household full of love, and yet you're willing to welcome more people in. You've been a delight to be with. We say thank you to you, and uh, thank you for all of you that joined. This will be available to you uh, in the next day or so, and then feel free to share it widely so other people can know how they can be uh, getting involved. So it's been an absolute pleasure, everybody. Delight to be with you. We will see you all very soon. Keep going. Don't give up. If you're angry, channel it into something good, and uh, let's go. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.